running joke was when's it going to be finished and i said by christmas i just didn't specify which christmas so when the third christmas was approaching um, my wife said this isn't funny anymore <laughs> we're going to be in the house by christmas so um we were technically in the house Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast, a regular discussion with building industry professionals. This is senior editor Patrick McComb. This is the second half of my two-part interview with project manager Jeremy Hess of CNZ Construction. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast and the original Fine Home Building podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can leave feedback and ask questions there too. So your uh, Techno Metal Post franchise uh, that you still have, right? You you use these uh, metal piles driven in with a small machine as uh, for all kinds of things. You told me sign uh, posts are often connected to them. Um, you've mentioned that they can support decks. Uh, sometimes foundation repairs can be made with them. We love them on at Fine Home Building because you can start building on them almost immediately or immediately, right? Yeah. But th- that, that work, I'll link uh, our story on the subject that you and Andy Engel did uh, in the podcast notes so you guys can see that if you're interested. Um, it's taken you to some remote places doing this with other dealers, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've been um, – I mean I've been to several East Coast states, which are not as exciting as they sound sometimes. Um, but I've also <laughs> been – I've been out to, uh, to Alaska probably I think five times I was out there. Um, over the years working uh, with, with Dave Northup, our dealer out there. Um, and it started out as him, he bought a machine out here on the East Coast from another dealer. And before he drove it back across the country with the truck and trailer, he stopped by my shop and we kind of got everything secured in his trailer and prepared it to go across the country. And um, he just in conversation, he said, hey, if I ever have the need at the time, I think he had one person working for him. So if I ever have the need, would you be interested in coming out? Well, yeah, of course I'm going to say yes because a I'd like to go and b I don't think it's going to happen. So there's no, you know, there's no, there's no harm in saying yes. Well, then like I don't know, it was like eight months later or something, and he uh, he calls me up and he says, "Hey, remember that conversation? I kind of forgot about it." And he goes, "I have a job coming up, and we have a very short window to get it done uh, because we got to do it when the ground's frozen. And we were not, they weren't having much of a winter that year, and uh, he says, got to do it when there's frost in the ground because it's in a really wet area. Uh, well, you've interested in coming out." So my uncle ended up going out with me as my helper, spent two and a half weeks out there um, running piles in the ground for a, uh, a, a walkway along a, fish, a popular fishing and hiking area, um, where in the summer when the ground was thawed, it was just a swamp. But um, yeah, we put in, I don't know, I think 240 piles or something on that trip out. And then since then, I've been out working in all kinds of places where we had to fly stuff in by fluid plane and helicopter to get into the sites. Um, couple native villages um so working kind of on those those alaska tv shows you see kind of working in those types of villages um so yeah it's uh, that that was a good that was a good time out there Uh, the the photography you put on your facebook page was just amazing It, it was so cool um and and you bought some little uh figurine animals uh and and was that bal- baleen or uh, ivory so that was so yeah there was baleen um so that was when i was on uh st lawrence island which is uh in the middle of bering sea kind of almost closer to russia than than alaska um but there was a several good craftsmen in there each village tended to have some specialty and this village was carving ivory So walrus tusks, that kind of stuff, they would carve. And, um, yeah, the locals, they don't get too many visitors out there. There's no hotels. There's no restaurants. There's the only reason that somebody from the, from outside, as they call it, comes in is to work. Um, so if somebody from outside comes in there, you're getting bombarded with people peddling their wares and, and, you don't buy the first thing that comes up to you. You kind of talk around, you, you look and you barter. I mean, I, not everything was bought with cash. I mean, I got a, a small owl. Um, one guy carved, there was a whale. Another guy did, um, I forget all the figures. There was a seal, a puffin. Um, but it was, sometimes it was just going, taking them over to the local, to the little village grocery store and buying them some food. 
and uh, that's and that was what they wanted to swap. Um, but yeah, it's it's a different way of life out there, um, and it's yeah, it's it's some of it's similar to what you see on the TV shows, and some of it's more depressing. Um, I'm just, sure. Yeah. Were you glad to get home? I bet you were, just because of the like cost of food and uh, no. you didn't have a lot of options, right? Oh, I, I, it was funny because I'd go into the the village store there, and uh, most villages have like a local store run by the tribe, and then they have a commercial store that's run from a by a company I think based out of Seattle or something, and um, so that's most of the shopping done in the commercial store that has all your name brand stuff that kind of thing. But if you want to wash your clothes, like a small bottle of clothes detergent is like thirty five bucks. Um, loaf of bread is 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 ten bucks. Um, and I mean, I'm sure there's prices. Twenty nineteen was the last time I was out there, um, so those prices I'm sure have gone up. But most of that stuff's being flown in by an airplane, and if if it, sometimes on a barge, but if it's a barge, it can take a couple months to get there. So normally it's coming in by plane, and it's just it gets super expensive. Um, yeah, and it's funny because like something like a bag of chips, you wouldn't think would cost all that much because of the volume it takes up on the plane. It's they're expensive. So <laughs> that's yeah. a birthday present, right? A bag of chips. <laughs> yeah, you, you 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 tend to lose a little weight when you're working in those areas because you just can't afford the extra food. You have what you brought with you, and maybe a snack once in a while. But um, I was delighted to learn that you listen to Pro Talk when you're out driving around. Uh, and you offered to be on the show, which I'm grateful for. What do you get out of the show? Um, I've always been a, a troubleshooter um, and like the challenge. I was more of the why buy it when I can build it type of person, even though it might take me three times as long. I might actually might not actually finish and it would cost me four times as much. But I'd still I like to learn new things. Um, being that I'm still in the, in essence, remodeling world, working on a lot of older homes, um, it's nice to, I like to hear solutions, different solutions to problems. Sometimes I know what the solution is. I like to hear what somebody else comes up with. Um, it's just, it's educational uh, is the big thing. And it's also stressing the need to, need for skilled trade workers. Um, you know, always kind of keeping that, that in the forefront and that the trades are, they're not like a second thought or, a backup plan like a trade can be a full-time career and you get out that of you enjoy <laughs> right yeah yeah you get out you put into it and i mean i built my own house from the ground up um it's some of that came from my experience and some of it came from just having to i had to learn new things like i i never messed around with duct work before so i had to learn how to size duct work now i had a HVAC buddy who double checked my work and and uh, but I mean I I did the I ran the duct work I did all that stuff myself um, so it's 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 the learning aspect of it it's the 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 stress on the skilled trades that kind of stuff I like hearing that. Speaking of which, uh, you have a trade school education. Do you think your uh, program adequately prepared you to do what you do or when you started? Yeah, um, I kind of. In high school, I, I knew I wanted to work in construction, in the construction field. I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. At first, I thought, oh, architecture, I could design stuff. Well, then I realized what that was all about. I was like, yeah, <laughs> that, no, that's not for me. Because um, I saw too many plans that architects drew that They're obviously wrong. anything. Yeah, they obviously never built anything. So um, I was like, no, I, if I'm going to do that, I want to actually know how it's actually done because I've actually done it. Um, so then I looked at doing uh, a project management degree, but realized that was all office work, basically no hands-on. Um, and then I settled on, a, I ended up doing um, building construction technology degree from um, Pennsylvania College of Technology, which when I went there, it had just the previous year or two, it had been taken over by Penn State. It was Williamsport Area Community College in, in Central PA, Mountains of PA, but um, it just been bought out by Penn State. So it had the Penn State name and the Penn State resources, but didn't have the Penn State price tag or the Penn State politics yet. 
Um, so it was kind of nice. It was it was a lot of there was nursing students there. There was auto mechanics, diesel mechanics, ex, yeah, um, uh, excavation, heavy equipment um, jobs there, uh, degrees there, uh, building construction stuff. Um, so we are the program I did was probably fifty to sixty percent hands on, and then forty to fifty percent classroom. So you learned how to build something and why you flashed a window a certain way or why you installed house wrap or why you nailed studs a certain way. And then you went and actually did it. Um, it and then there was some business. Uh, we, we did draft, there was a drafting component to it. So you could, you drew something out no, and then had to figure out how to build what you drew to realize that, yeah, maybe you can't build everything you can draw or not build it effectively or efficiently. Um, there's some estimating classes in there. We were estimating entire builds. Um, so it, it did a very good job. It was kind of set up that you could come in, you could get your the basics in, go work in the field, and then potentially start your own business. Um, so you have that background. Um, so it's set up real, it, that, that program was set up very well. I've, I've since run into some people much younger than me now, which is kind of weird who have gone through that program. And it's good to hear it really hasn't changed much um, on the the actual, um, the, the, the main components of the program haven't changed, uh, which is good to hear and good to see because it was a really good program when I took it. Did you have family growing up who did trade work or friends? Were you, I mean, were you exposed to it as a kid too? So my mom's father, now he lived almost three hours from us. So I didn't see him a whole lot. Growing up, but he, um, him and his brother had a construction business in South Jersey. Um, so my grandfather was mainly the framer and his brother was mainly the trim carpenter. Um, and they built a lot of houses in South Jersey. Um, but by the time I was getting into the trades, he had already had a heart attack and a stroke and he was, he was not doing construction work anymore. Um, but I do remember going in the summers and I'd spend, we'd spend a week at their house in the summer. And I remember just seeing some of the places he was working on and that kind of stuff. And even when I was a kid, I would, you know, steal my dad's hand saw and hammer and take the lumber from the deck that he just tore off the house and go into the woods and build a fort. And then, you know, then spend the next three days in trouble because I lost his hammer. Um, <laughs> so... You know, even as a kid, I was doing that, always building stuff and trying stuff. And I mean, when I got started with my Techno Metal Tools dealership, I had very little welding experience. I mean, I wouldn't even really call it welding experience, um, but I had to learn how to st structural welding. And I ended up uh, taking a test of 3G certified so I can weld up to three quarter inch thick, um, any position um, and structural well stuff. I mean, I've been, since then I've built a couple of trailers for hauling material around for myself um, that were inspected and roadworthy and everything else. So it's, yeah, it, it there's been a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> you have, as I recall, two, two kids. Is that right? Yeah. You have two daughters. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, if your daughters came to you and said they wanted to be a carpenter or electrician or plumber or whatever, how, how would you feel about that? Would you steer them uh, in that direction or away from it? I've already been steering in that direction, but um, my my <laughs> older daughter she's she's fourteen, so she's to the point where she wants to make her own, you know, choices. She's happier on the computer and doesn't really necessarily care to be dirty and sweaty. Um, but I do see her get satisfaction about completing tasks and projects. So it's a matter of maybe maybe she doesn't want to help me in the garden or help me on a roof or something like that, but maybe there's some other aspect of the trades that would appeal to her that would make her feel satisfied. Um, my nine year old, she's still happy just to do whatever daddy's doing and helping. Um, but I, we, I do have my wife and I do have conversations with them occasionally about, you don't have to go to a four year college. You don't have to get a degree in whatever everybody else is. Like there's always going to be work in the trades. Um, it doesn't matter what, artificial intelligence comes along and stuff that so you're not going to get a computer to fix a clogged drain or to rebuild a house after a fire, or there's just a lot of work out there in the trades that is just going unfilled right now. How do you see that getting resolved, Jeremy? Or, it, or 
if I had the answer to that, I wouldn't have to be working in the trades. I don't think. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it's it's a. I mean, it's something that's come up a lot for for me. I mean, just in my finding subcontractors and skilled subcontractors to do work. Um, I've had so many. Like I, I have a plumber, an electrician, a couple other specialty trades who just have a hard time keeping employees. They're just they're they're jumping ship for something else. And I mean, all the the Amazon warehouses come into the area. I think they've had a pretty big impact on the labor pool as well. Um, because, you know, what used to be delivered, packages used to be delivered by one UPS and one FedEx guy are now being delivered by 20 little vans, mm -hmm. which are all being driven by people who, you know, even if 10% of them could be in the trades, it would be a, a huge, a huge difference in the labor shortage we're dealing with. And, you know, and the other issue is, some guys think just because there's a body on a job site that stuff's getting done and that's just throwing bodies at, at, at projects is not the solution. Um, one guy that knows what he's doing can do so much more than three people that don't. And so just because there's bodies out there doesn't. So it, it goes back to the training and to the education and taking the time to do that. You've had both the experience of running your own business and working for a couple others. Uh, have wages gone up uh, with the trade shortage, or has it just staying the same? It's gone up some, but the problem is everything's gone up. So I'm not sure that I know that the company I work for that we did an adjustment about a year and a half ago, and what we were paying are we have as far as in-house field crew, we have um, our demo crew, so we have about a dozen, I guess, in the field who go in, they, they handle the content. So they pack people's personal belongings up, take them to storage, take them to their cleaning, to the cleaning facility. Um, they do the demo, uh, a lot of the demo, tearing out flooring, drywall, all that stuff. Um, but they're not skilled. So they're not putting stuff back together. Um, we did an adjustment for them about a year and a half ago, made sure, reevaluated what we were paying, what their responsibilities were because, and we, you run into it pretty much anywhere, but um, people want to be paid for a job they're not yet doing. So they want the increase, and we see it a lot on our field side, uh, where they want a raise, but they're not necessarily doing anything to reward that, or raise, reward that raise. So we try to watch out for the guys that are going above and beyond and compensate them properly and let it be known that, hey, if you go do the extra step, if you stay an extra 15 minutes, and make sure the job, the, the driveway is broom swept instead of me having to run out there tonight because the customer got a flat tire. Um, you know, we, we make sure that we, we, we reward people and we, we let them know what they're worth. But um, yeah, we've been trying to adjust accordingly as far as, as pay scale goes and that kind of stuff. Um, but it is, it's, and it's, it's a balancing act because, you know, they have other options out there. Um, whether it be warehouse or, um, you know, other contractors. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Well, uh, this is my favorite part of the show. So as I recall, it was pretty near when we first met that you started building your own home. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, that would have been, it would have been, man, it seems like a long time ago, 20, 2013. So about halfway through our relationship. Halfway through, yeah. And as I recall, you had your family living in a mobile home while you were building, right? Is that how that was working? Yeah, so um, before my wife and I had kids, uh, we had, there was a property came for sale. It was one and three quarter acres, had a double wide on it, and but it had a well and a septic system already on it. And we were looking, we weren't sure what we wanted to do. I wasn't quite in a position where I could build something at that point. Um, but where the property was, um, it was in a area zoned agricultural, which is right up my alley. Um, you know, you can kind of do whatever you want and nobody bothers you. Um, so we, and when I was looking at other properties, I was finding similar sized properties for more money with no well, no septic, nothing. So, uh, we bought that property, lived in that um, till our first child was born. And then when my wife was pregnant with our second, we were like, we, I got to do something. And our 
intention when I bought the property all along was to where the double wide set on the property was kind of out of the way. So I, I, there was room I could build a house and live in the double wide while we were building a house in the, what it was the front yard at the time. Um, so, you know, once I went through the process of um, my, my, I was working full time for somebody at that point. So the plan was I was going to put the foundation, I would dig the foundation, put the foundation in, and then we we're going to get a, do a modular. Um, I know that's not necessarily a good word, but do a modular. Um, we're oh, I like think a, you know, anyone who listens to this well, show knows that there's every version of modular, good and bad, right? Well, it, gets, it gets better. It's a Cape Cod modular. So, um, so, <laughs> so that's what I was looking at doing. And um, I was going to, since I was going to be acting as my own general contractor, I went and talked to the bank and was, you know, talking through loan process and stuff, construction loan, this and that. And, the, the amount of additional fees and interest because I was acting as my own general when I did the math totaled almost the framing package if I would just buy the lumber myself and build it. So I went home that day and told my wife how it went at the bank and told her we were going to build the house ourselves. Um, so was she excited or was she scared or, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we ended up, um, I, I, I'd already applied for the building permit, I think, for the modular. So I just changed it, kept the same footprint and everything, just told them it was going to be stick framed. It was no big deal. Um, and then horse traded with a neighbor up the road who had a Cat 315 Traco and uh, brought it down to the house one weekend, dug the hole, uh, formed and poured the footings the next week, had a poured wall guy come in that I knew did my walls. Um, and then just throughout the summer, Worked on framing as I had time and money. Um, got it under roof by the fall. And then um, it took. So when I started it, the running joke was, when's it going to be finished? And I said, by Christmas. I just didn't specify which Christmas. So when the third Christmas was approaching, um, my wife said, this isn't funny anymore. <laughs> we're going to be in the house by Christmas. So um, we were technically in the house. Um Granted, we slept on an air mattress in the master bedroom, and one of the kids slept in a closet, but we were in the house um, for, for that Christmas. Um, but, uh, yeah, right now I'm currently uh, finishing off the second floor. Um, I just It's one of those things you get busy with life, and before you know it, you're two, three, four months down the road, it's a year down the road. Um, but the kids are to the point where they're tired of sharing a room, which is supposed to be my office. Um and it's time to get them moved. My so, I'm um, the ups the second floor. Like I said, this is the Cape Cod. Um, I put some decent sized dormers on, and, I, and actually, I, I might kick myself for it here in a couple of weeks. But I put nine. I had the room, so I did nine foot ceilings up there. Um, four and a half foot knee walls and nine foot ceilings. So it feels really big up there for being a Cape. But you're gonna uh, regret it because you're wor- that it's gonna be harder to drywall, right? That's the yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I measured, and I can get fifty four inch sheets through my window. Um, mm. But it's just, yeah. You know, but I, I think I think we'll like it in the end. It's just when I'm hanging drywall in a week and a half, I'm probably not going to be very happy with myself. Um, but yeah, I just actually picked up the line sets for my mini splits for up there. We have a ducted system for the first floor, and then I'm doing a three zone mini for the second floor. Um, the theory there being there's going to be one room that's my wife's craft room and kind of her area, and then the two two additional bedrooms. Um, so. They, the, the craft room probably can be kept at a less um, aggressive temperature um, for most of the time until she's using it. And then when the kids are moved out, we can shut the door at the top of the steps, turn them back to low just to maintain it and and, and have that. Um, so I got the line sets, picked them up this morning so I can get them run. Um, it's basically the last thing I do before I get the drywall in. But the goal is I heard to cop- have – what's that? I heard copper tubing is still crazy expensive. Was that the case? Where Forty-five dollars for <laughs> old, old copper tubing, ridiculous. And that's not even installed. That's just sitting in the back of my truck. Um, so yeah, so I get copper, get that in, um, and then the goal is by the beginning of the school year in the fall that the girls are upstairs and they're in bedrooms, they're in bathroom, all that kind of stuff. Which I'm. Of course, a little behind schedule, but I can make up for it. I'll just throw bodies at Do it. you get help uh, or do you just do it all yourself? Are you going to tape the drywall, for example? So I, my drywall sub I use in my restoration side, he has said he would be 
willing to take on the finishing. Um, yep. And I'm still, I mean, I'm old, I'm, I might look old, but I'm not that smart. So I still think I can still do that stuff all myself efficiently. And I'm not sure that I can. Um, so my, she, my wife kind of, I think she put her foot down. She said, no, just pay somebody to finish the drywall. It'll take you way too long. So it takes forever, I, dude. Yeah. Yeah. It takes I, forever. Just, I just got to kind of come to the realization. The problem is I do just enough drywall patching in my normal day to day. Like, you know, at the end of the job, there's always something that's gotta be patched. I was like, yeah, this is that bad. This won't take me that long. And then like, yeah. <laughs> and then I, I yeah, it takes a lot longer. So, um, yeah, I'll hang the drywall probably next week. I'll be in the next week. I'll start that. And then, um, get my buddy in the finish and then we'll, we'll just kind of keep rolling through it. Um, but there's always going to be that one piece of trim that I'm getting told needs to be installed somewhere. That one transition strip. I know right where the transition strip is. It's my kids are going to have to put in the day before the set. They sell the house when my wife and I are gone. It's just going to be that. I might even have it in the closet, cut the fit, but just not installed. You know, it's, it's just going to be that one thing. Do you like the work? Uh, even after doing it 40, 50, 60 hours a week on, on your own house? Yeah, it's, I, I do like it. I mean, at least when I'm working on my own house, I can see the benefit and the payoff. Um, and I do enjoy working on other people's houses, but the thing is I'm putting really nice stuff and doing really nice thing to other people's houses that I don't get to enjoy. Um, but at least this way, I'm taking the time. I'm doing it on my own house. My kids are going to be able to space. My kids are going to use. My wife's going to be able to use to have her own space, um, which will end some conflict on the first floor at times. Um, but, yeah, that kind of stuff. Um, so I do enjoy it. Um, and the fact that I'm not swinging the hammer every, every day anymore and then coming home and doing it, it's not as big of a deal. It used to be such a headache. I would be in the field all day working with tools, then come have to load them up at the end of the day, come home, unload them to work on my own house, then load them back up to go to work the next day. And, and this when you get into the summer, it just gets to be gets to be so tiring doing that. But now that I'm I can leave tools set up, um, stuff set up, and I don't need to worry about taking it to work for me the next day. It's, it's, it's it is kind of it is kind of enjoyable and relaxing. You have uh, an outdoor hobby too. You, you're always outside. I see photos in uh, your Facebook feed that, yeah, hunting, fishing, I'm guessing, traveling. Yeah. 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 yeah we're, we actually were going, leaving this afternoon to go up to the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon for the weekend to an area we really like to camp. Um, and next weekend, we're going camping at a state park. And the following weekend, we're going to the, to the UP of Michigan for vacation for a week, which we haven't taken a vacation, a week vacation in years. Um, so we're going out to Michigan. We haven't been out there before, so we're going to go check out. I've always um, been interested in the Upper Peninsula. I've never been, but it's always been on my list of places to check out. What makes What's making you go there? Um, haven't been there before. And um, we're looking at, uh, we have a, a travel trailer, so it's like we can take our, our house with us, which is convenient, but, you know, fuel's expensive and everything else but it is convenient to have our stuff with us um but yeah we're gonna just want to see uh is it uh mackinac island up there the bridge um going up to sault st marie gonna do a tour of the locks so i i like i like history stuff i mean i'm uh, about an hour from gettysburg so um i enjoy going to gettysburg and just walking the battlefields and, and that kind of stuff so anything history related we really, we really like um and we like to just kind of show our kids to kind of what there was before smartphones and tablets, um, you know, how stuff operated, how stuff worked and, and that you can have, you can have fun and a good time without an electronic device in front of you. Oh man. Dude, it has been a pleasure talking to you. Is there anything you want to tell or ask our listeners before we go? Um, I guess just to, no matter how little you think you know about a topic, try to research it and teach somebody. That's a really good way to learn stuff, um, especially if it's related to the trades. I mean, I've worked with, I've worked with guys who um, didn't want to teach anything. I worked with them, and I one guy in particular who's an awesome trim carpenter did not want to teach anything. Was he um, worried you were going to take his job? Is that his rationale? No, no. He, I think he was just allergic to people. But he, um, yeah, he. Uh, he just didn't like to just didn't like necessarily not, not teach anything. And then I've worked with other guys who were just a wealth of information, a wealth of knowledge, and they might not 
necessarily have known the exact right way to install a door or a window, but they were willing to e even listen to, hey, maybe we should put the tape on this way and that would work better. Oh yeah, that makes sense. And instead of, no, that's the way I've always done it. That's the way we're going to do it. So just being open to learning and open to teaching um, is a big thing. Uh, just sharing information. I think we've become too isolated with being able to look up a topic on our phone right in front of us and get an answer versus talking to somebody else who may have done or may know. May know. You know. There's people out there willing to teach. You just gotta. You just gotta ask. So be the person willing to ask, or be the person willing to teach. Man, you should be on this show more often. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, third time's a charm, man. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Jeremy, it's been awesome. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank you all for listening, and thanks to Jeremy Hess for joining us. And uh, please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find the podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Happy building. <laughs>